Hello, and welcome to the Natural State Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Anthony Gustin. It is my belief that the natural state of any living organism is health, and that our artificial habitat has forced us into having artificial health problems. This show is my attempt to dive deep and learn about using nutrition, sleep, movement, relationships, and more to help you reclaim your natural state of health in a modern world and show you how to thrive in an environment that's stacked against you. If you enjoyed today's show, you can find out more details and information at dranthonygustin.com. Today on the podcast, I have Dr. John Jayquish joining us, who is quite a character. This guy has a lot of amazing information that is a little contrarian, and I tend to really like those people. He's also very upfront and blunt with what he thinks. So if you are sensitive to foul language in this one, I would say probably not the one for you, but if you are looking for unfiltered information about why weightlifting might not be the best thing for you, then this episode should be right up your alley. Doc has done a lot of stuff. He started in biomedical device engineering and then switched and made a couple of different machines and then moved into try to figure out how to get people the best bang for their buck and invented a device for that as well. Wrote a book on it recently. Super smart guy. Tells it like how it is. And I really appreciated our conversation. Before we get to the episode, I wanted to chat about our sponsor, Perfect Keto. Perfect Keto is all about making a ketogenic diet healthy and accessible. Whether you're reading all of our online guides or articles or enjoying Perfect Keto's exogenous ketones or any other keto-friendly products, everything you need to make keto work for you is at perfectketo.com. I know what you're thinking. Hey, aren't you the founder of Perfect Keto? Yep, that's right. And all of my insanely high standards have been put into making each and every product. My background as a functional medicine clinician helps me craft the cleanest and healthiest possible products and the best information about a ketogenic diet. Head on over to perfectketo.com to learn anything you need to know about the ketogenic diet. And if you've never tried any of our products before, feel free to use the code Keto Podcast for 20% off your first order. With that being said, let's get into the show. Welcome to the show, John. Thanks for having me. You got it. We were just talking before the podcast a little bit and uh, you wanted to d- dive right in because you were starting to throw out some, some hot fire, some nice facts. And yeah, you got me ranting. So <laughs> it was like, hey, let's, let's get this on video. <laughs> Uh, so the, the first one that I like to dive into is just the concept of people, you know, obviously want to be fit right now. They, people have been restricted to access to gyms, a lot of victim mentality. I think your opinion is that less that people should be rushing to get back to them. Well, their gyms are closing and then opening and closing and opening. And I, I can sort of see why. Uh, I think the whole, like, you need to work out with a mask on that rule was written by somebody who's never exercised in their life. <laughs> Cause if you're doing anything worthwhile, you're moving a lot of air. Yeah. I mean, I had that, that experience actually at a hotel a couple of weeks ago where I was in the hotel gym and using some equipment and there I had mask on, I had to wear a mask and I left within five minutes and went to my room and, and did a bunch of body weight stuff because it was impossible. I don't know how people sit in there. Yeah, you, for like, are they, are they well, you don't know. Of course you know how. They're not really working out. They're just pretending. <laughs> going through the motions, which a lot of people do in gyms. Part of the reason so many people fail. So, okay, we have the mask thing. Um, what about as far as you were saying before we started recording around transmissibility of viruses in gym settings? So, yeah, I mean, rightly so. People are worried about gyms being huge. Uh, pathogen communication sites. Uh, now, when you lift and and exercise in general, you're basically spitting all over everything. Because when you really have to move air, you breathe with your mouth, not with your nose. The air flies more. You're pushing uh, mucus, you know, kind of all over everything. And uh, it's just how it works when you're breathing hard. And uh, we see, uh, there's a study that came out a few years ago. This is before, it had nothing to do with coronavirus. It was just showing how dirty fitness facilities are. There are 300 times the viruses, bacteria, and other pathogens on a, a standard dumbbell or a, or a barbell or any other piece of fitness equipment. 300 times than there are found on a public toilet seat. So... Yeah, they're dirty. Uh, no, I mean, I think most people don't really care because they've always been that dirty. And people who go to the gym, I think some of them eat healthier. Of course, what does that really mean? Yeah, uh, yeah some of them 
uh, have a, a more favorable hemoglobin A1C score so they can fight off different infections much easier. But uh, for, for me and what I tell people, and of course I didn't start my company to promote leaving the gym, but it's like, why screw around? Just work out. Like my, my product, uh, this isn't my opinion. I can scientifically back this up. I even wrote a book about it. Uh, but you know, you don't need all the stuff that's in a gym. What you need is much more simplified and much more powerful equipment. Uh, and so, you know, I developed the X3 to accomplish that objective because I was a busy guy. Like I wanted something that I could just use for whatever the workout time was at my house, because I don't have time to drive to a gym. I don't want to screw around with it. I don't want to listen to somebody else's garbage rap music. You know, I mean, you walk in, it's just like, what is this? Why do I have to listen to this crap? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All the whole experience uh, is is annoying. Did, did you have a past where you did do a lot of weightlifting, use traditional gym equipment, and yeah, out? yeah, the entire time I didn't even look like I worked out. It yeah. was great. Uh, yeah, for like twenty years I was in the gym all the time, and uh, I don't know. I was a pretty good rugby player in undergrad, and then I did some semi-pro uh, rugby after that. But like the gym never really did me any favors. I was like, I think I started when I, when I, you know, like when I graduated college or undergrad, I, uh, I got weighed like 160 pounds and that was pretty lean. And then I got up to 190 pounds and I was not lean. Mm. So I didn't really, you know, I was like. Bulking season or what? Well, it was it was more like I tried consuming more nutrients to sort of force a muscle to grow, uh, which doesn't work at all. Um, you just get fat. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah. So, like, what led to the shift of or experimenting? How did you get to the point you're at right now? Where I mean, you have a very different system in how you approach weightlifting, I guess it wouldn't be weightlifting, but working out, exercising, stimulating muscles and this stuff like that. So what, what was that path like? So, uh, like people were like, who, you know, who is this Dr. Jake, which guy, like he kind of came out of nowhere and it's not, that's not quite right. I came out of medical device development. So I invented a medical device. So I've, I have a lot of experience in this. I just haven't been around a bunch of, you know, gym people. So, what I, what I, uh, what I did was I developed a medical device to treat, uh, bone density loss and create very powerful bone mass to become fracture resistant. So I did that. And in the process of doing that, the device has to do with putting load through bone in impact ready position. So like the position, if you're going to trip and fall, you're going to have a 120 degree angle here and your elbow is going to be up and the back of the hand is going to be aligned with the clavicle. And you, you, that's how you would protect yourself from impact if you, if you're falling. You're doing it as an isometric? No. Directions no. or through a range? Uh, the range might be like a millimeter in that, in that specific area, the 120 degree angle. Uh, yeah, isometrics are, you can, you know, do a literature review on it. They don't really do anything. Uh, not bad for activating. So like if somebody really needs a lot of power in a position, they can activate a little bit, but what I'm talking about is more powerful anyway, because we do go through range of motion, but the movement is actually from the compression of bone. Hmm. So you actually distort the length and shape of the bone while you're under these forces. And so it triggers very rapid bone growth in, in the right population, you have to be relatively ambulatory, relatively pain-free. So somebody in a wheelchair is probably not a good candidate for it. Uh, so an, an active population. And uh, so while I was developing this, I, just, I looked at some of the forces we were using in a, uh, the first uh, clinical trial type study was done in London uh, through the University of East London at a, at a hospital um, in Stratford, 
Stratford and London. And so we looked at the data that was coming out of this and I saw postmenopausal women who have never exercised in their life, still pain-free, still ambulatory, but the most unathletic people you can imagine. And they were doing fantastic. They were using, so they start off by loading their hip joint with three or 400 pounds. And in a month or two, they're up to six or 700 pounds. What was the, what was the hip joint angle? The knee angle. 120 angle of inclusion behind the knee. Yeah. Yeah. The hip was just at a regular position standing or? Uh, no, it's, it's done seated. So yeah. it's, but it, you're, you're leaning back a little bit because you don't want to slide out of the seat. I mean, there's some just ergonomic realities you have to deal with. Is it like a leg press sort of setup? Yeah, a little, a little more like a leg top, like almost the top of a leg press type of position. But the machine is static, but you can move three or four inches. Hmm. But that three or four inches of movement is from the compression of the joints, the connective tissue. And uh, yeah, I mean, your schooling is like right all about this. Like yeah. you, you, you know, bone is bendable. You just don't see it usually, but you can actually see it while somebody is doing this. Uh, and, you know, now those, those uh, devices they're found at uh, OsteoStrong locations. So they have an exclusive worldwide license for the technology. Right. And, uh, that, and that's what I'm partnered with Tony Robbins on. Uh, so Tony's, Tony and uh, the CEO of that company, Kazagratsky, who really designed that clinic model, uh, that's getting all over the world. Uh, so you think this is a good solution for people who are just generally want to be, build more muscle or be more athletic or prevent injuries? Or is it, it was like very specifically for people who are at risk and they're a little bit older, like, and they want to be. So it's, it's that. both those populations. It's the athletic, I want to be indestructible kind of person. And then it, or I want to be injury free, but that's probably not how they word it. Uh, they, they talk about being indestructible. Um, and then, you know, the population that's, that, has low bone mass or osteoporosis, but still has the biomechanics available to perform the movements. And, and so, things. so early onset is a population, early onset osteoporosis, or, or sorry, uh, uh, menopause, that, which triggers lower bone density earlier in life. Therefore, you know, by the time they might reach 60, they have osteoporosis. Yeah. So do you get them in a position then and then load the basically increase the tension of the weight and then have them just stay there and keep pushing? That's how, that's how it's done. So it's like kind of isometric, but not isometric. Or is it so like a robotic a arm get them a robotic arm gets them in position, Got it. but you can't actually do an isometric to fatigue in that position because there's, there's such pliability hmm. uh, in, in the bone mass. So you know, and like I said, the isometric studies, I, I, don't, I don't like that word because most studies that reference isometrics were like when people would do this. So just kind of force. This is like the shittiest angle ever. So you can't actually stimulate anything because you're not getting a lot of force through the muscle. Yeah, you can go to fatigue, but so what? Like a wall sit. You can do wall sits day and night. You're going to get any stronger? Absolutely not. It's like just torture. Right. That's all you're, all you're accomplishing is pain. So the difference here is just the load to the, the, the vector load through the joint. Yeah. Yeah. Very well put. Interesting. And then have you guys done any studies around how that impacts not only bone mass, which is probably very easy to tell, uh, mm -hmm. muscle mass, but connective kind of tissue and tensile strength of tendons and ligaments, things like that. So there's already a lot of research on that. And we ref, yeah, uh, Benjamin and Ralph's 1998 is probably the best study on the compressive forces through impact or impact level loading in joints when in the axial format, you know, like, like as in almost lining it up in a linear, you know, like this is almost a straight line. You yeah. have to have almost a straight line. A straight line doesn't do it because uh, you can't push, you can't create any force. So, uh, 
Yeah, there's a lot of great research on that already. Because, you know, ultimately, it's better to reference other stuff that was done by professors at universities that I have no financial relationship with, or the research was performed before I invented the thing. Right. So, no, because, right, you know, right now, the world, and, and rightly so, the world has become very aware of conflicts of interest in research. It's sort of like vegan research seems to always be funded by... <laughs> Uh, uh, Kraft and Nabisco and General Mills or some of their surrogate like charities, which, you know, are only just trying to prove that carbohydrates are great for you or trying to falsely claim that carbohydrates are something you need. And it's, and it's because, and so like, why do they want everybody to be vegan? They want everybody to be vegan because they know vegans don't eat vegetables. They eat cookies and candy bars and crackers and everything else. Every weak ass sissy loves to suck up all day long, but they're convincing people. I, I'm a straight shooter, man. I'm just going to uh, say, I like it. it. I like it. Right. I mean, like, yeah, it's like, you know, every, every, every guy is like, well, I've lifted for years. I haven't got anything out of it. You know, as they put like a Snickers bar in their mouth and you're like, mm -hmm. well, you're right. if it fits your macros, as they say, you're right. Right. Cause Kale and a Snickers bar are the same. Okay. Uh, right. So, um, so I mean, just bringing it back to, I'm really interested in this machine that, I, okay, we have all of this increase in muscle mass, bone density, mm -hmm. probably connective tissue as well. Uh, what about movement patterning on top of that? So, you, let's say you build this stuff. How much do you encourage proper move, movement patterning? So, for athlete, for whatever their sport specific thing is, probably. The the users uh, at the clinic they they do some movement training post so after they've given uh, sort of a neural potentiation a short term yeah. potentiation stimulus to the machine like you know you're you're lit up like a Christmas tree from an EMG standpoint now EMG doesn't mean a whole lot by itself but when tissue is active and you do like a balance training type thing so we do whole body vibration and go through a protocol on that to build the balance and mobility right after that session. Got it. Got it. Uh, and that's proven very successful. People like go from hanging on with fear to the railing on the stairs to running up the stairs and not even touching the railing. Yeah. That, and that kind of change in behavior where it's first is subconscious. And then they go, you know, I don't grab onto the rail anymore. Huh? It's weird. You know, it's not weird to me yeah. because I know exactly what's going on in the body. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the things that when I was in practice treating NFL players, for example, that I knew their strength and conditioning coaches and programs that had some of these fancy things in there. But then most of these athletes would then have non-contact injuries because they weren't integrating any of this training. And I mean, it's just like one of the most bizarre things. And that's why, yeah, the, the fact that you combine it with the, the vibe plate plus this plus movement stuff is like such a great combo. Is the, is the CNS load pretty extreme kick? You can only do this like a couple times a week. You can only do it once a week uh, and it, partially because of the C, CNS load. Exactly. Like, I love that you know that, yeah. uh, but the, uh, but the other thing is the metabolic rate of bone, like primary mineralization after an osteogenic loading episode is between five and 10 days. Oh, wow. Secondary mineralization takes 144 days. Interesting. I don't know. Bone doesn't change out all that fast. You know, whereas like your lungs and your cardiac muscle is a very rapid metabolic rate. Yeah. Got it. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it has to. It has to be able to recover quick. So um, we only do sessions one time per week. Fascinating. So the, the bar you made then, is that sort of a... Uh, how do I bring this to my day to day without having to have a giant machine and protocol or what was the thought process on training? No, that, so the bars, the bar is different. The bar is not for bone density. Got it. Uh, X3 bar is what we're talking about for the listeners. Um, that was more like when I looked at the data from this bone density device, I thought like this proves weightlifting is a garbage stimulus. Hmm. Because if we're seven times more powerful in the extended position than we are in the stretch position, 
why would we ever exercise with the same weight in all positions? Sort of weight's got to, right. The weight's got to increase dramatically increase, not just like band training because band training by itself is totally worthless because you can't get the magnitude of change. And if you do like the bands that come with the X3 bar, they're 50 to hundred times more powerful. Like when I do a deadlift with the X3, it's 615 pounds at the top. Hmm. That's not a rehab band. That's not a Walmart band. That's something special. Right. That's nobody makes a band like that except me. Uh, so, and, and so you were just looking at the literature and thought, okay, at these different, at these different biomechanical positions, we have different load, and if we're, we're optimizing basically for the weakest link in this position down here, then I'm shortchanging about seven times if I'm at a fully extended position. So how mm -hmm. do we train that? We train out the band. What are bands like? And like, how do we make it then a device that you can actually, I mean, anyone who's trying to hold onto a band, I mean, even do like payoff presses with a the band is tough. It slips in your hands, it digs in your hands and stuff like that. Oh, it's so, digging in your, it's, it's bending your hand the other way. Right. Like you can close your hand, but it's trying to make your knuckles do this with your palm up. That's, that's called an injury. <laughs> that's yeah. not, yeah. So band by itself is just junk. And you can't, you can't use it. But an Olympic bar is a very smart invention, especially when it has rotation. So, you know, like, I mean, here's the X3. Like, this rotates, but my hand stays, stays in the same place. So I can alter my grip and always optimize it without, without twisting my wrist. And like I said, you deal with much more force using this device than you would weightlifting. You know, so, like my, my chest press is 540 pounds for 20, uh, 20 to 30 repetitions. I'm not going to hit 20, 30 repetitions with, I'm not going to hit two repetitions with 540 on, like on an actual stat bar. I would never even do that. If I drop it, I'm dead. Right. I mean, I mean this is one of the biggest things too. Like you, I'm always a fan of things that are more simple and re you know, reduce the risk of injury as much as possible. So when people are, deadlifting 800 pounds, squatting 500 plus pounds, and then going to fatigue, I mean, you're just asking for an enormous injury. I mean, this is just something that like, I get that we live in an artificial world and we sort of need to use some techniques and strategies to balance that out. But no one was, no one had 500 pounds in their back going up and down any time before a uh, hundred years ago. It just didn't happen ever. Right. And people were still strong. Right. I mean, look at the physiques of, of chiseled out, you know, marble models in the past. Like mm -hmm. people had the physiques that they desire now. Oh, the Hercules statue from like the 1600s. Like who sat for that? Right. <laughs> Somebody sat for that. There was some guy that actually looked like that. And that guy, if you were around a day, he'd be Mr. Olympia. So wherever that guy was, you know. It might even be, it may have even been like 1200 or something like that. That's an old sculpture. So when you, when you then switch the bar stuff with, with X3 and coming up with these protocols, where did you find sort of the diminishing returns here? Was it just one exercise, like a couple sets once a week? Like what, what is sort of, you guys deliver a protocol with it or how do you think yeah. about the- Yeah, it's one set that? per exercise. Got it. Uh, and the reason is that the level of exhaustion is devastating. Got it. Like it's far beyond what you would get with weight training. Uh, and the, you know, uh, anything in nature, like it's like, how many sets do you need to do in the sunlight to get a tan? <laughs> right. I mean, what a stupid question. Well, if everyone understands that that's a stupid question, then isn't everybody stupid who, who knows they have to do more than one set of weight training. Like the only reason you do more than one set is because it barely works at all. Yeah. To stimulate you, growth. Yeah. Cause you, you weren't getting the maximum amount of load because you were training towards the least common denominator with the weakest. Right. You're exactly, you you pick a weight that you can handle in the weakest range of motion where you use the least amount of muscle tissue and the rest of the movement, you're hardly switched on at all. So, so how does this change per person who has, different joint positioning, different length, uh, limb length, things like that, different biomechanics. Like does the, is it pretty fair to say that 
the band works for everybody or like there are different bands for like tall people, short people, et cetera, et cetera. You can, you can roll the band up on the hook so that it'll, it'll be shorter for the shorter people. But we have, um, I think 40, maybe 35 uh, NBA players. Cause we have the whole Miami heat team. In fact, the back of the book has an endorsement from the Miami heat. They actually let me use their name, which they, you know, pro teams don't do that because they protect their brand. You, you got to make, you, know. the, you got to make the bands just a little bit stronger for next year. Right. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the, the basketball players use it and they just go a band lower than like I would. Cause they're strong guys, but okay. they have very long limbs. Got it. Okay. So, you know, you just pick a different. So this, if the strength, like, so basically the maximum tension at the top of the band would just be more cause they're taller. So they should choose a lower band than you would have. Okay. Mm -hmm. I got it. You know, and there's other, so I have in total, there's the Miami heat, uh, that's the only whole team. And then there's about 30 other professional athletes and uh, NFL, 12 NFL guys, uh, a couple of Olympians, um, Swedish soccer, I'm trying to think who else. Uh, so a lot of professional athletes have switched to this and they're not lifting weights anymore. So, you know, I, I, I use that as an example, like, you know, somebody who's skeptical about this and who might not be able to appreciate research. There's a lot of people read research and they're like, this is like looking at spaghetti. Like, I have no idea what this is supposed to mean. I get it. Like research is not written for regular people. It's written for the people with the education to read it. Right. Right. So, you know, professors write it for other professors, not for somebody who's got a sideways hat on who spends hours in the gym every day. Uh, so with this system, are you saying that this people, when they go to do weightlifting are trying to gain muscle mass or train their muscle tissues? And this is a better version of that. Or how do you think through the benefits of it compared to a traditional weightlifting program? So, it, I mean, size and strength, but you can also get more strength without the size by, by uh, altering your diet a little bit. Okay. You know, so you kind of limit the amount of protein so you don't have as much hypertrophy, but you can still get the neurological and the recruitment effects. Uh, pound, so per, pound per pound, you're stronger then. Is it sort of like the... Yeah, yeah. You get a better power weight ratio if you do that. Interesting. And so what about like uh, as far as like a metabolic... It's like when I think about fitness, I think a lot of people just think if I do this one modality that I heard on the news or see my friends doing, I must be fit. So I'm going to go run 20 miles a day and that, that'll make me fit. Or I'll go do bicep curls every Tuesday and then that'll make me fit. I think it should be a little bit more of an integrated approach. So I'm just curious how you think about how this fits into a, like a little bit more well-rounded uh, movement. It, it, it is a little, it is more well-rounded. It hits every muscle in the body. Yeah. Uh, so there's movements for everything. Um, and not a lot of movements. There's really eight main movements and two supplementary movements. Was uh, it squat, deadlift, overhead press, bench press? You got it. Horizontal row. How do you get a, what am I missing? How do you get a, like a vertical row, like sort of like mimic a pull-up? Um, I'll show you. Yeah, the, um, here we go. So it's like a bent row. Mm, got right it. Yeah. You see the plate I'm standing on? Yep. If you don't have that plate, you break your ankles. Because the tension's so high? Yeah. 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 So if for people who now, listen, I'm pulling like 250 at the top. So for people who are just listening, didn't get the visual, it's um, basically like a, a rectangle plate you're standing on and then a band around that and you're holding the X3 bar and then doing basically... Right. A bent row 20 inches wide 11 inches deep got it yeah i mean the one thing when i was thinking about this is i haven't used this yet i, I, I mean i'm super intrigued now and want to see how it goes but the like the 
the recruitment of like the lower lats and like, how do you think about getting that? Just, just go lower on the, that row to get that a little bit more with that like tension in the vertical through the. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, also lower and upper lats, like you've read the research, it shows that you actually can't trigger just one part of a muscle. Right. Like you can't train your upper packs or lower packs. It's just, they're all, they're all connected to the same place. They're all firing. And the people with giant upper packs, it's like a fingerprint. They were born with that shit. It just showed when they started lifting. So, you know, I love guys that have like a really tall peak, you know, like, like my bicep is long, but you know, some like Arnold Schwarzenegger is like an apple. So, you know, or like th this tendon looks like it, it comes closer here and the guy's got like a taller peak. Well, like I said, there's no training that makes the shape of a muscle. Right. A lot of people. Just, that's the shape of the muscle. Training of people larger. Many, many years trying to figure that out. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's fortunately there's a lot of research because I think sports scientists get really tired of hearing like, oh, I'm really focusing on my upper pecs. And they're like, oh, God. Now, triceps behave more like three different. Uh, sorry, not triceps. Uh, uh, deltoids behave more like three different muscles. Mm -hmm. Like you can contract your, your frontal deltoid. Your posterior deltoid is stretching. Right. And it's not, it doesn't have activity. So even though we look at that, like it's one muscle group, it's really more like three. How do you think about this combining with a little bit more dynamic movement and the necessity for that? Combining it with dynamic movement? So a little, like, like for example, some, like one of the things that I always, with the weightlifting programs that I get sort of confused about is that we, we're humans who locomote. So we move around throughout the world. Mm -hmm. Everything in weightlifting programs are static. Like we're not moving throughout space. And so it's just a weird, or very little, like why, why are we not training the main thing that humans do, which is moving throughout space? Okay. I, yeah. Right. I do have an answer to this question. Yeah. The, you graduate when you start training your lower extremities, you first do a regular squat and then you switch to a single leg squat or like a split squat. And the reason we do that is because unless you're a kangaroo, you walk on one foot at a time. Right. Right. And we drive with one leg at a time. So that's how we push ourselves forward. So, yeah, I mean, it's still set up more like weightlifting. So we're not moving necessarily, but we are enacting what we do when we move, especially with speed. Yeah. So yeah. like people, people are reporting like their sprint times are going down. You know, like I, I'd love to like set a couple of sprint records because I know I'm, I'm, I was old fast and I, but it's like, you know, I'm, I'm 44. Like that, that, that's an injury way to happen. <laughs> Sprinting past like 25 years old is like dumb. Like yeah. you don't want to do that. Uh, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be cool if I could, you know, run a 40 and four or five or something like that. it would be cool. I wouldn't put it past you. If you, you're the guy. Yeah, I wouldn't put it past me either. But like, I just, I just don't want to like, you know, it, it's just a dangerous thing. It's like, what am I trying to prove? Who cares? Yeah. I mean, I think that, I think about sort of health in compartmentalized ways, but all the same principles. So for example, with movement health, same with, Let's say even say your gut, just to make it easy, an example here. Uh, a lot of people, if they, like any human who's just born who has, eats a normal human diet, which nobody does anymore, their gut health is totally fine. They can handle eating whatever. With movement, if you, if you train and do all of this stuff and you've never had any movement problems throughout your life, you should be able to just train these muscles and do these things and then go kayak or rock climbing or whatever. And you have totally fine movement patterns and be great. However, we have such weird environments that sometimes the artificial sort of deviation from what a human should do requires an artificial, artificial solution. So even if you're eating shitty food, you can't just eat good food or even carnivore or, or anything like that as a reset diet. Sometimes you need an artificial intervention to clear out the gut, sort of reset things and build it back up. The same thing with movement. Sometimes I think it's unfortunate what people don't realize is that they have been sitting their entire life or doing really weird and awkward movement patterns that they put this stuff on top of it it's not like adding strength to it is it necessarily the solution to it. 
and that's going to fix all their other movement problems and pain and injuries like that. And I'm just sort of curious your take on interventions to correct like improper things that lead to pain in joints or tissues like that. Yeah. Uh, we were going to have something important. Yeah. There's, there's um, a lot of chiropractors and physical therapists who are using X3 uh, for, for corrective movement patterns. Now, I'm not going to build any of those protocols. I am super not qualified for that. Hmm. Uh, you know, and that needs to come from somebody who practices therapy. And, you know, like there's a lot of examples of people, like I know a lot of people practicing therapy, like sometimes they see a dysfunction and they have to do some guesswork and experiment with three or four different movements. Absolutely. Yeah. Like you don't, you don't really know, like you can't, you don't have x-ray vision. You don't know what's not firing and what is firing. So we're just going to run some experiments and it takes a knowledgeable person. So when somebody has a movement pattern problem, like they don't have any flexion in the feet, you know, not, not somebody with drop foot, but somebody that can't really get their feet up or they don't have, it's almost like their ankle is like frozen, you know? So when they go to squat, it's like everything's a mess. Uh, you know, like I, I'll, I'll tell, I have a whole staff who answers questions and comments. I don't answer my own comments, by the way. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's just, um, you know, I'm not talking to the carnies. Uh, so, uh, the, somebody with a dysfunctional movement pattern, I love how you know this. It's like you, you clearly have some some uh, special internet commenters as well. Uh, but the the uh, the move, like somebody has a dysfunctional movement pattern. I'm like, just get some time with a physical therapist. You know, of course, then it's like, well, my will my insurance pay for it? And I'm like, who cares? You can't walk right. Just take care of that. That is like your health forever. Get you fix that movement pattern, and if they do it right, it'll stay right forever. Exactly. It's only like, I can't think of a better investment in your health. People try to, to try to find all these weird secrets in health. Yeah. And it's like, oh, well, I heard from this one person that you should use a sauna only at 175 degrees after 9 p.m. But before you work out and after you take about 250 milligrams of buffered calcium, but, you know, only, but only if you know, it's every other day and there's a full moon, it's like, that's going to like help increase your cardiac output. It's like, do you keep, like you said, can you walk appropriately? <laughs> do your joints work like a normal human? Like right. do you eat real food? Your you, joints, you sleep deep every day. Right? Yeah. Like, once you start mastering some of these things, like with anything in life, I think that always coming back to the fundamentals is, is something that people avoid. Cause I think that we, at a point where like we think like these little factoids or what in secrets, like it, it shouldn't be that obvious. There has to be something. I mean, I'm sure you get this comment all the time with, with your setup. Cause you look at it and you're like, certainly this, this can't do everything that I needed to do. Certainly it can't be this simple. It's like, well, are you still, yeah. Yeah. You're like you're getting the maximal tension throughout the, the movement of this joint. Yes or no. Like that's well, and, and also, you know, anybody who's in the like, like motorcycles, like Harleys. Uh, my dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody knows somebody like this. They, they get their bike and they show it to you and they're really excited. And you're like, yeah, cool bike. Nice. And then they have a whole plan. Like they're going to spend like a year customizing it. And what do they do? They really just fuck it up. It just looks like shit. Looks worse than it did, you know, the day they got it. And they spent like an extra, I don't know, 5,000, I don't know what motorcycle parts cost. But you look at it and you're like, why did you think this was better? And there's something, and these are intelligent people. Like, you know, Harleys are like expensive now. Uh, so I, I see them doing this and I'm like, it's really weird. You did something that's very similar to what my customers do. It's like, it's perfect the way it is. I wrote a book about it. Stick to the program. You know, I say, I quote the Mandalorian. This is the way, you know, so like, don't ask any questions, just do it. And, you know, if you're a medical professional, okay. You know, maybe there's some therapy type stuff you can do with it, but you can do that because you're a therapist. 
or you're a chiropractor because you know what you're doing. But the regular person, you know, the regular investment banker out there, just follow the program. And they, but they get the product and they can't wait to start adding extra shit into it or modifying stuff and because they don't understand the principles because they didn't read the book or memorize the book, which is what I'd prefer. Uh, they don't understand how they're like compromising many of the principles. And then at the same time, also using an almost injury free product to almost go out of the way to injure themselves. So yeah, I just, I just don't understand why people, look at exercise science and just haphazardly start changing stuff. I, yeah. I think, I think people like to think that simple doesn't work because then if simple did work, why isn't it working for them? You know, why, why, they why don't right. they have their goals? You know what I mean? And, right. But I mean, from the most simple standpoint, if you're seven times stronger and your stronger range of motion and you're on your weaker range of motion and you're, and you're lifting regular weights, you screwed the pooch already. Mm -hmm. You're not going anywhere, which is why, and I make, I make this argument in the book in a few different places. Why defend the fitness industry? I believe it's the most failed human endeavor. Like if part of that's because of nutrition, because, you know, there's people who work out hard, but then they only eat pizza and Twinkies. Uh, and then there's other, other people who just, you know, they, they, they lift like they've been told to. And, they're not stimulating anything. Well, because the lifting is really inefficient. And uh, you know what the biggest genetic difference is between athletes and people who can't seem to become athletic? As I identify this in the book too. Hmm. You know what it is? What is Almost it? nobody knows this. It's tendon layout. Hmm. Like, like your, your pectoral tendon typically attaches right here. Right. And the humerus bone is brought across, like forward or across the body as you contract the pectoral. So it's pulling from right here, pulling that across the body. But when we look at Mike Tyson's tendon layout, it's not here. It's here. So why can he knock somebody out who's four inches from his face? That's why. Right. And that, and, you know, when somebody who's like really good at the bench press, you know, probably the Bell brothers, you know, just gifted at lifting weights, they probably have an advantageous tendon layout, but that's really the only difference. There's birth weight is kind of a, an example of a genetic difference, but that also has more to do with how big somebody is, you know, all over like tall, like, you know, Nord Nordic children, tend to weigh more than, you know, uh, Western European children or Asian children or whatever. So that, that has a genetic effect as how just large a person is. But when it comes to muscularity, the tendon layout is really important. And what does that mean? They have a stronger, weak range. That's mm -hmm. why Mike Tyson can give an uppercut right inches from his face and knock somebody out. Or, or stun them and then get back a little bit further and then really hit them. So, and I mean, that was his whole career. He ducks in and gets inside of the person's space. And the whole time the person's trying to push Tyson away, but he's got his power available right up close to someone's face. And uh, that's why Customato, when he watched Mike Tyson train, he said, that guy's going to be the greatest boxer the world's ever seen. He watched him for an hour. And he, he could just tell, like, there's, there is a genetic difference there. And he capitalized on that because he understood exactly what it was. Never told anybody about it. Interesting. And so, yeah, and I, and I detail this in the book. And there's research that, that, uh, that, that backs it up. 20, uh, wait, I think it's 27% of people who lift weights have no ability at all in any way to create muscle protein synthesis. Wow. None. And that's just due to... They'll never grow. And so that, that has to do with the genetic differences. However, mm. you notice with a strong ratio of variable resistance, like I designed in X3, that genetic factor is irrelevant. 
Because if you have a strong weak range, okay, it doesn't really matter. You're still going to fatigue in the weak range and in the mid range and in the strong range, which you cannot do with a weight. Hmm. What do you think about the machines like the ARX machine? Oh, the ARX machine is great. It's a $400,000 X3. <laughs> right. So it's awesome. I love it. Yeah, it's similar, similar principles there, right? Because you can I will the, say it gives it gives you data, which X3 is real simple, you know, and elegant. I don't want to underplay it. It's awesome. It is my invention, so I'm gonna say that. Uh, but it, it's it's uh you know, ARX gives you a printout and looks at your power curve and probably gives you a lot of information you can't do much with, but it's a lot easier to track progress. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing, Yeah. but you know, it also costs more than my Lamborghini. Right. So, yeah. you know, I'd rather have my Lamborghini in an X3 in the trunk so I can work out on the side of the road, which I do. Interesting. So, you know, you never do any other type of workout. Do you ever do any, any sort of cardio type of stuff? No, it just, just I don't believe there is such a thing as cardio. I think cardio is just really shitty strength training and it doesn't stimulate anything. Yeah. Yeah. Because, because strength training actually stimulates the cardiovascular system to a higher level. Yeah, you know, this to a higher level of performance. I, co I cover that in the book too. Yeah. Like, like if you want a healthy heart, cardio is not as good as strength training, but what's, there's a myth that has come about by, observing larger strength athletes like if i run up a flight of stairs and a marathon runner runs up a flight of stairs by the time i get to the top i might be a little bit out of breath i might have some sweat on my forehead but, yeah, but I weigh, the, what you're moving yeah the mass you're moving right it's not just the mass the muscle my quadriceps right they need more blood it's a bigger engine you know like there's you're not going to find a v12 engine that's going to be very fuel efficient that's not what it was built for. V12s were for going fast, right. quickly, like getting up to speed. Yeah. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's purpose built. You become purpose built by the way you train. Now, also, if you try and be like cross trained, you're, you're giving the body conflicting signals. So you're sort of guaranteed to not go anywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, like you do your cardio and you increase cortisol, which, gets rid of muscle and protects body fat. So it keeps you fatter longer. That's what cardio does. So also people who think they're losing weight with cardio, huh, there's 40 years of research that shows that that doesn't work, but you know, okay, be my guest. It's what gyms are selling. So, you know, like somebody says, well, why are people so misinformed money? What do you think about all the bodybuilders do the low intensity steady state stuff? Like when they wake up fast and they go for a long brisk walk, stuff like that they're still compromising their muscle building ability. Now, a lot of bodybuilders are throwing in some other factors, right? Uh, some other, some other growth inducing <laughs> things that might cancel out a high level of cortisol, you know, I mean, but that, that's, that's victory by, you know, pharmacy. Okay. I mean, that's the thing. Like if that's how that sport operates, I have a lot of good friends and good, your great customers that are bodybuilders. Uh, they're starting to really get it, you know, cause it's like telling them like this title of this book, like they were like, I had, I had guys, you know, they're like, how could you do this? It's like, I advocate for you, you know, sort of like I insulted their family and it's like, don't look at it that way. Like once you read the book, you'll understand. Now notice I didn't call it resistance training is a waste of time. I call right. it weightlifting is a waste of time. There, there's just a better way to put force through muscle to trigger more growth. I mean, last I checked, the goals of people uh, who go into a gym are to create an effect in the body. Now, there are some people who I believe their biggest objective when they walk into a gym is throwing the weights on the floor and making a big noise so they can be a spectacle in the center of attention. Oh, yeah. That is a psychological dysfunction. I can't help those people. And they, and they have they they have a lot of mirrors there too. So that's also a plus. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, these are the sideways hat guys. Right. Yeah, like I'm you gotta have... throw the weight. There's a great YouTube video of a guy dislocating his shoulder while throwing the weight down. What is this? Were his fingers just wrapped around the bar or what? Uh no, no. Oh, it was yeah. actually the uh, the act of pushing the bar down. 
<laughs> like accelerating the, you know, the gravitational pull and guy dislocated his shoulder. Oops. Yeah. Oops. Like uh, he worked I'll... harder at making a loud noise with the weight than he did actually doing the lift. Doesn't sound very safe. Well, it, it tells you about the psychological problems of some of these people who their, you know, religion is lifting dangerous weights to show how badass they are. Yeah. What? Yeah. But I mean, those, those losers, they're not my customer. So, you know, fuck them. But um, do you do for like recommendations for nutrition for people who want to add some, let's say they're using your protocol here, they're using your, your device. Like what, what do you say? Is it, is it like a very simple approach or is it? Calculated per body weight. Well, it's quality protein. Count your grams of protein. Uh, keep carbs as low as possible. There are there is one benefit of carbohydrates, which is muscular hydration, which you take advantage of after a workout. And I, I put that in the hyperplasia protocol. So it's a combination of eating carbohydrates while stretching, mm. um, or like kind of right before you stretch. So the muscle glycogen is coming into a muscle that's being pulled. And the fascia gets stretched as more hydration gets into the muscle. Uh, you can accelerate muscle protein synthesis. It's kind of an advanced technique, but of course, seemingly everybody who lifts thinks they're advanced. Like they read a Flex magazine in high school once, so clearly they're almost just like an NFL player. Uh, oh, like the overestimation that people do of themselves is. Spectacular. Never the pro athletes, though. Pro athletes have the most perfect read on their capacity. And I think there's something to be said. There's almost not a single NFL player that uses the elite band. That 600 pound deadlift. They're like, that is too heavy. I can't do I can't do it because they know they're supposed to go slow and controlled in the repetitions to get all the stabilization firing, which influences uh, growth hormone upregulation. That's chapter two of the book, chapter three of the book. Uh, they understand all that and they read it carefully. And then because they know they need slow and controlled reps. So I see a lot of people getting the elite band and then they just do kind of halfway jerky, like fire into the movement and let the thing just like, spring right back at them. It's just like, wow, that is the opposite of why I developed this. But uh, yeah, you know, you got a dirty Harry says man's got to know his limitations. Yeah. So, and, uh, yeah. I mean, you do, you need to know where, like what's going to stimulate growth, slow and controlled will stimulate growth, higher repetitions, will yield a greater level of fatigue in the mid and weaker ranges, which is why minimum 15 repetitions and maximum 40 repetitions. And those are all like two seconds up, two seconds down. So, so do that, eat a lot of meat. Yeah, and then count your grams of protein. Now, uh, don't, I tell people, don't, don't consume whey protein. It's not very bioavailable. Uh, you, you, 80, uh, 80, 82 percent of whey is, uh, just goes through as a waste, hmm. just nitrogen. And, uh, most vegetable sources are like 91 percent goes as waste because it's not the right essential amino acids. Right. Right. So if it's not, if it's not the right essential amino acids, it's just tossed. So why bother? I mean, this is part of the reason why like you can suck up all the pea protein all day long. And you know, if you know anybody who's tried that, like they're getting smaller, they're losing muscle mass. Um, you know, it's malnutrition. I mean, it's just very clear. If you want to be like something, eat something that's close to that thing and like provide this similar raw materials. It's very yeah, I mean, you can't make that as a blank blanket statement because like rhinos are pretty strong. They have a high power to weight ratio. They eat nothing but vegetables, but sure. well, well, like, this is just a totally caveat. different biochemistry. Yeah, we'll give a caveat for monogastric animals, humans particularly. Right. Yeah, yeah there you go. Yeah, you can just look at the size and capability of the digestion 
of a human and it needs concentrated nutrients. Yeah. Because we don't have a lot of intestinal wall. If you look at a gorilla, it has, I think, four times the amount of intestinal intestinal wall um, you know, volume. Yeah, and they, they can ferment things in their gut differently. It's just a completely different physiology, like you said. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to add this to, I do a lot of gymnastics training lately. Um, it's just fun for me. So I enjoy it, but I want to add this and see and do some before and after picks. Post- Make sure you get one gram per pound of body weight in protein. That's right. the only thing I count. Yeah. I, I mean, my carbs are, I don't know, just almost nothing. Uh, and there's whatever comes with whatever cut of meat I happen to get. Like, I think I'm doing some tuna and cheese later uh trying to get most of my nutrition in that one meal because i'm having sushi tonight which is not really food enjoyable though sometimes you get a splurge oh yeah it's it's wonderful but you know i I put in the same category as like oh we're going to the you know the chocolate expo it's like okay well i'm eating beforehand right so the strategy there and i'll be like with my toothpick like "Mm -hmm, yeah i'm full i'm fine all right, Doc. Well, tons of great information. Appreciate you coming. Yeah. Up. yeah, have a lot of things that you could intro people to. So, where do you want to send people who are interested in more of your work? Ah, uh, so my last name is kind of difficult. Not everybody can spell Jake Wish right, and uh, I, uh, I I intentionally misspell it on Google and see how many like hits. Like people are screwing up my name all day long to try and find X3. So I, I created a landing page. It's drj.com, D-O-C-T-O-R, the letter J.com. You can find my Instagram there, which is probably where I'm posting the most. Uh, and I give a lot of free advice there. And uh, also Facebook, you can find the X3. You can find uh, the supplementation, uh, the, the protein supplement that, that uh, I created um, well, I worked with a lot of people to create that. I shouldn't take sole credit for that at all. Uh, but yeah, that, that's a bacterial fermentation uh, type protein. Even vegans can eat a bacterial byproduct and still stay vegan and they'll get a high quality protein. I think that's the only option for vegans. It's like before vegans would come at me and they'd be like, you're such a jerk for recommending meat. I'm like, hey, I also make this thing. And this could like really improve your performance. And of course, a vegan who's eating you know crackers and cookies and i guess a kale smoothie every once in a while you know all of a sudden they get like like a lot of essential amino acids that uh you know their their body's been looking for some of them for years like immediately like their skin improves and their performance improves their energy improves their sleep improves so like they really see it because they're coming from such a compromised position yeah Great stuff. You can find all that drj.com. Thanks, Doc. Yeah, awesome. This was fun. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Natural State Podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, I'd really appreciate you heading over to whatever service you're listening to this podcast on, dropping me a five-star review and your thoughts on the show. This helps us get discovered by more people and spreading the good gospel of health. And if you want to stay plugged into all of my self-health experiments, recent research in books that I'm reading and my interpretations of those things, products that I'm testing and thoughts on all things related to health, check out my free weekly newsletter called The Feed. You can sign up for that at dranthonygustin.com slash The Feed. That's dranthonygustin.com slash The Feed. Thanks again for tuning in and your support of the Natural State Podcast.